Hey guys, welcome to Break the Chain. I'm here today with Sergei Brazhnikov. Sergei is a personal trainer, a health and wellness enthusiast. He campaigns for animal rights and he's an advocate of a plant-based diet. He's also a recovering alcoholic and party animal. Um, you grew up in Russia, didn't you? Can you tell us a little bit what it was like growing up in Russia? Because I imagine that that had some effect on the, on the way that you, um, you evolved. Yeah, um, it's, um, it's definitely one of the, you know, well, my, my backgrounds that uh, definitely impacted me quite a bit. We, we were growing up in a small town uh, in Irkutsk, which is in Siberia. And at that time, you know, when I was born, you know, the USSR has broken up and and things were changing. So um, people were surviving in in many ways, and and there was lots of criminal activities, of course. And um, it, it wasn't as bad for us. Like we we lived quite um, quite good. We weren't poor, and then but we weren't rich as well. So my mom and my dad were working, and my dad is in the military. Um, and so we kind of just, yeah, we're growing up there and, and it was, it was rough at times, you know, like people, people are a lot more, you know, um, I would say less emotionally expressive in terms of like, you know, happiness, you know, like you gotta be a man, you gotta like, you know, you gotta drive yourself to be that, you know, like, okay, I'm strong and blah, blah, blah. So it's, um, it's an environment where like, you know, um, you go through a lot of fights and, and, and definitely growing up in a military, um, family as well. It's like, you've got to have like discipline and make sure that you follow, um, like the orders that say, or something like that. Um, and you make sure that you do your homework and like, it's, it's, it's a lot, um, harder for people to comprehend, but it's, it's, it's a lot like, um, um, it's not like in the movies where like everyone is just so bad, but I would say it's still, you know, rough for some people, um, because the disparity and then, the, um, sort of like a gap between the poor and rich is, is quite wide. Um, and, and yeah, alcohol is like massively prevalent in, in the culture. And so it definitely had some sort of impact in considering that my grandfather was an alcoholic. So it, it definitely kind of impacted me in, in a sense, yeah. You have to wonder why alcohol is so predominant in this in these areas. I mean, I, I've been to parts of Eastern Europe, not Russia specifically, but people are just a little bit, you know, they're more closed. They don't, they're not likely to engage with you in any way if they don't need to. They barely sort of look at you. Um, you know, you, you, I can't imagine them opening up to each other um, st- sober, uh, on a regular basis, I mean, in England, it's <clears throat> it's quite similar. I mean, people do sort of like open up to each other a bit, but it's probably like when they're drunk and then they wake up in the morning and they're like, oh, "I haven't got any problems," you know, until they get drunk again and it sort of all comes out again. Do you find it's like that? Yeah, I mean, like in Russia, like if you read old literature and stuff, like they, they talk about love and like you know, like a lot of romantic um, poets and 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 all of that stuff came out of Russia. But in the sense of like actually expressing yourself, how you feel, it's like yeah, it's very difficult for people, and especially if you're like a guy, like talking about how you feel, like you instantly get cold names and like you know, um, it's not normal, and then. Considering that, like back in the days, technology wasn't really available um, as such, like YouTube and stuff. So you you kind of just knew what you knew, um, and 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 it's hard for people, yeah. Like especially when you drink alcohol, become aggressive, and um, and you kind of regret it. But at the same time, like you 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 just have to um, kind of look at the culture and, and why we don't get taught to at all, like to share stuff. Like you just, yeah, you just have to go in your own head and ride through the motions. Um, and it's hard for people to do that because like, yeah, in, in, especially in my school, like if you do something and you express yourself in a different way, you get beaten up, you know, it's, it's yeah. not normal to be like more on the softer side, um, be more vulnerable, you know, like you get called, you know, um, homophobic names and stuff so yeah I think that's quite normal it's, it's, that, um, certainly when I went to school it was very much like that do you, do you feel like for the discipline that you actually tried to rebel against that 
because they sort of tried to squeeze you into a certain into a certain mold and suppress you so much you feel like you rebelled against that uh yes and no like because i kind of just tried to like without realizing i tried to fit in into the into whatever we were doing like even though looking back we were like 12 or 13 we kind of felt like you were grown up and you can do lots of things that you think you're like an adult you know so you tried to fit in because all the the cool guys were doing like you know stuff like trying to steal cell phones of people and stuff like that but if you if you rebel against that like you get yeah you can you you get just beaten up like either you're by yourself or you're just part of the group you know what i mean and and because we were in one of the um in the school where we our own like um how we say it, we we say it in russia we say it class so you're in the class and you've got 30 students and like me and my couple other friends we're kind of like the strongest guys in the class and so we were just you know like beating up other kids and stuff like that without realizing it so it, it was uh, and of course the the students that were above you as well like they were beating you up so you you kind of have to look at either the introverted kids and if they try to rebel of course you get beaten up and you just have to go with it um you just have to be strong i guess and 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 try and, and fit in into that culture yeah um, otherwise you're just by yourself yeah like I, yeah i got totally dragged into that uh, that whole thing as well you know i I don't know if it's because I'm tall or if I just had one of them faces, man. But people just used to punch me, <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't. I wasn't definitely wasn't a, a tough kid, you know. I like um, even from the age of like I guess from a, like even for like primary school, like I get bullied pretty bad, and then it just starts this thing. You just pass yeah, that. we you just pass that on, don't you? We had the same thing. Like for some reason, the taller kids would get so much shit. Like we would just take a piss out of the. The, the taller people, we would say, like, why are you so tall? You know, like, we were just picking on them for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know people have the theory yeah. that, like, the, the big guys must be the tough guys, but I'm soft as shit. But then, but then yeah. as, soon as, as soon as I went to secondary school, when I was around 12, I just had this, I just started wanting to be this tough guy because I thought that by being the tough guy, somehow you'd be accepted or feared or that deep thing, like, like people are going to accept me or at least acknowledge me or respect me or something if if you are that tough guy so i play i tried playing that tough guy and you know i'd have fights sometimes i'd like start it for no reason and then get not beat up but like i'd lose in the eyes of the fight and it's like man you got beat up and it's like you know and it's just like there's like this thing that you're trying to chase and it's like completely backfires on you then not only that even if you win a fight then their brother and his eight mates stamp on your head and mm. smash your head in with a baseball bat which happened to me more than once yeah. and it's just yeah, like yeah. it's just so not cool yeah we we had all sorts of fights like i mean like two of my mates were fighting and then um we were watching it and then some other guy started kicking the jacket of the guy that was getting beaten <clears> up and i was like what are you doing and all of a sudden that guy who was kicking the jacket was fighting with me and then everyone sort of broke away from that fight to watch our fight. It was just like, it, it was mental. Like looking back into it now, it was one of, yeah, I don't know why that, that happens. I mean, that happens everywhere around the world, I guess. It's just the the conditioning that we see on a daily basis and in school, yeah. Yeah, I really think yeah. everybody within that whole thing, if two people are fighting, they've got something in common. They're both, you know, they've got some internal pain that they're trying to express and trying to uh, figure out through some way. And there's two people are clashing heads like that. They've got a lot in common. I actually yeah. rec- recently uh, messaged someone like, who I would have considered to be my all-time biggest nemesis, my biggest enemy of all time. And I messaged him and I'm just like, hey, mate, I know we kind of had got on in the past, but I actually really respect you now because he's like a professional boxer. Um, I sort of followed yeah, his yeah. career and I was like, fair play like, I've got so much respect for what you've done you've proved everyone wrong and it's sort of like there's this mutual mm. respect and it's just like what the hell are we fighting for you know mm. just trying to be yeah, cool, yeah. trying to be cool and be accepted by my own friends and that was all it was about and I'd like to just say to anybody who's younger it's just like just stop that shit you know just break that chain as, as soon as you can because it's just it's ridiculous yeah. isn't it yeah and 
the thing that hit me the most was when I was in Thailand a uh, year and a half ago and I met up with my old school friend that I haven't seen for 14 years. Uh, we met up in Bangkok and we were talking about all the, the kids that were in our, in our school in our form. And so majority of the students, like one of our, one of our best mates who we used to, um, you know, hang out with, he lost all his teeth from drinking. Like he's just gone completely alcoholic. And, um, another guy, um, I remember he was already sort of like not normal back then. Like he would do stupid stuff like run and smack himself against the wall and stuff. And he, he actually like in jail for murder. So he is just like, you can kind of start to see the tendencies right from when you're a kid, whether that person might be triggered to go down that path. And if yeah. no one saves them or no one intervenes, like they are probably going to continue with the same stuff, like the same habits and same lifestyle, you know? Okay. Um, and the guy that I met in Bangkok, he was the only one that made kind of something out of his life and travels the world, you know, he, he can afford stuff. and Yeah. You know, it's uh, there's a very clear divide between the. Yeah, in my in my world, I don't know that many people who've quit drugs, and e and even for me, the decision, like, it's, I I guess it's only recently where I've made the decision where it's like you actually need to do that as a permanent choice forever, and say like I am never ever going to do that again, and that's still it within me that that to say that is still so so hard. Yeah, like that 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 final yeah. decision. But you, you, you made that decision, didn't you? What was it that where you said, like, I'm never, ever going to do that again? Well, I got I got arrested a few times um, for, like, drink driving a couple of times. I uh, got arrested for willful damage. And then the last one was the, the assault charge um, when I just completely blacked out. I didn't even know what, what happened. And I woke up in the, in the cells in the morning um, completely like high out of my mind and and just I just didn't know what was happening and then it was just like a nightmare because I had a conversation with my friend the night before and he said that he got done for an assault because he was just so drunk and then here I was waking up in the cells with the same thing and I thought it was a nightmare but it was all real um and and I had to do anger management course um the CADS community alcohol and drug services for 12 weeks and Luckily, the the charge was dropped and and everything was fine. But um, maybe four months down the track, it, it kind of set in my subconscious mind. Like when I was sixteen, I never was wanting to drink because I knew my fa grandfather was an alcoholic and he, he actually lost both of his legs. Um, his both legs would go amputated because he he drank and smoked every day. Wow. Um, and 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 he um yeah it, it kind of. I knew what it does to people. So it, I never knew that I was going to be in this sort of place, in this situation. So four months later, after everything, I kind of started questioning everything. I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, if I'm going to continue doing this, I'm going to end up like my grandfather, you know? Like, it's 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 inevitable for me to, um, to go down that path if I continue because we were drinking excessively. Like, one month we were drinking for the whole December and we didn't even stop. And, and it was at the time it felt normal, but, but then you kind of step back and look at it and you're like, what, what, why was I doing this? Um, and then, yeah, slowly started to just completely, um, completely thinking about like stopping. And then one day I woke up and I said, that's it. Like, I'm not going to drink ever again take drugs ever again and that, that's how it, it and so since 2013 i haven't had a um drink of alcohol so it's it's been almost yeah seven seven well years done. now well done man. yeah i think i think in, yeah. in a way it's quite common when people have seen it uh traumatize their own family or had a parent who's been completely out of control through drugs or alcohol or something along those lines it gives them you know, it gives them a, a, a good sense of the whole picture because I know for myself, I never had the full picture. All I had was the fact that there was peer pressure. I didn't really want to do drugs, but my mates was doing it. And that the only thing I was thinking about in that moment is like, I want to be accepted by my friends. I don't want to be left out of my, my I didn't have loads of friends when I was younger. I had a few and a few yeah. good friends, like maybe around six. 
never really fitted in anywhere else. And they were doing that. It's like, shit, man, I've got to do that. But I, ne- I could never uh, associate, uh, associate that doing that with, with you know, having your legs amputated or in the, in the case of, like, what I was addicted to, you know, even by the age of uh, 20, if you start, even within a few years, you can actually destroy your bladder and have a colostomy bag. And I know people who've had yeah, yeah. parts of their bladder removed or, you know, and had to have a bag fitted and stuff. And uh, it, it, I think it's really important about, like, to see the whole picture, which I think you was really fortunate to have been able to see, like, the whole the whole thing from such a young age because now that we're, we're only starting to see that after, like, 10 years of our addiction when people are actually like, oh, well, now people are actually, like, really messed up by this thing and now we see the whole picture. But I find it's funny with the addiction yeah. is, like, it still sells you that glamorous image. When your mind brings it up, it's like giving you that 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 high yeah. glamour, that glamour, and you've got to like you see the glamour, and you're like, <gasps> and then you like, but then you like have to force yourself to look at the other side of the picture, of like, all right, yeah, mm. and then yeah, 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 you, you feel ace, and then in ten years you have a piss bag. <laughs> it's like, oh. yeah, it, it's exactly right, and then you you see the advertisements um, for vodka, for example. You always you always see these like businessmen with their glass in their hand and. They like rich and and it's selling that that upper class sort of mentality to people and like that image that you are successful, you can drink and blah 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 and and same with like beer, you know, you always see that um, exclusive sort of like lifestyle that that gets pushed to people always. And um, I remember, um, so when I was doing CADS, um, I was going to. Uh, on the train every day because I didn't have my um, my license. I was driving on the train there, and on the way there, I saw three billboards um, in front of the building where it was CADS, like Heineken and stuff. So when I walked in um, into the into the room, the guy was like, "Hello, blah blah blah, welcome." And then when we started, you know, sharing us things, and I said. And I said to the guy, and I was like, um, when I was on the way to this CADS meeting, I saw so many billboards, and I felt like I had a drink. So he looked at me really funny, and, and I, I thought, you know, I just cracked a joke, basically, but he didn't like it. And and it was that, just like realizing that these advertisements work so much on sub- subconscious level, and they sit in your subconscious level so much, because you think they don't affect you, but they do. And it and it triggers something in your brain when you like oh okay Heineken like because I've seen it so many times you know it's just like McDonald's you know the everyone knows what McDonald's is yeah uh, certainly um, certainly for me yeah. I've had to really sort of censor you know the the input that's going into my senses into my eyes into my nose into my ears like what I listen to just to try and in, uh, certainly in the beginning accept or still accept how vulnerable I am. As, a, as an addict, I know I'm vulnerable, so I can't go certain places. I can't, I can do some things, but I can't listen to some types of music too often because it just, you know, it sends my mind and starts thinking about drugs and and parties. And did you did you find you had to do a lot of that? I mean, what was what was your process that you had to go through to get from the decision to quit to actually now? Do you feel quite comfortable now? I mean, you wouldn't. There's no way you'd go back from me from what from what I've gathered and seen of you. Yeah, I, I because I was a bartender as well, when I was going to CADS during that time, I was still bartending. So for me, it didn't make sense. Like I was like, well, if I'm going to stop drinking or minimize it, it doesn't make sense because all my friends are basically doing the same thing. So two of my best friends were, um, you know, drinking and, and partying. So we were doing the same stuff together so for me it was like they, they would text me and you're like hey hey let's go out and i, and I would t- i would actually message them and say hey uh, i don't like feel uh, i actually gave up drinking i don't i don't want to drink anymore and they're like ah you'll do this again next week you always say that you know when you hang over and i was like no nah, actually i am and then you kind of stop going into the same group um and hang out with the same people because there's just nothing in common anymore and, and your friends just completely change, like completely, because there's nothing in common anymore. And and you kind of just, you know, look into the alternatives and start exercising and, um, and look at the healthier lifestyle and it doesn't fit into that, that bubble anymore with the same people. So I noticed that I never wanted to go out 
to bars and 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 to hang out in the same places because it would trigger that you like i actually feel like drinking sometimes i was like man i, I can't go to these places because my personality is very addictive so if i drink like i drink all in you know i don't go to swim and step into the ocean to the knees and then come out i need to go all in you know mm. um and, and then there was the case with me, like I can't ever, ever have two drinks. I would, I would need to go all in, you know, and, and party like an animal, um, to, to the point where I black out, you know? Um, but it's mostly because, you know, there was some trauma or, um, things that I needed to release and, and depression that I had in the past was also getting masked by all that excessive drinking. So, um, and I guess, yeah, it, it, it needed to stop and I needed to stop going to these same places where people would have the same habits, you know, it, it just didn't serve me anymore. I didn't see it as very attractive. Yeah. Once, once you yeah. actually, once you actually took that, uh, the plunge to do this, do the sober thing, which is, I, I know is horrendous. How long did it actually take you to sort of get, because obviously once you've, quit that you sort of like all right hello depression I, I remember you but i've covered you all over for a long time and once you and then you have to sort of like you actually have to go through that how long did it take you to actually come out of the other side of that i would say maybe a year because when i was drinking and then i decided to stop i also changed my lifestyle like i changed my eating i, I started eating very really healthy and more plant-based and yeah, I think my liver was detoxing quite a lot, like on the major level, because, you know, all the years, seven years of excessive drinking is just going to do so much damage. So when I started eating healthy and, and stopped all the um, damaging habits, I, tr I was transitioning to another work and I was working for Isuzu car company in the marketing department. And I remember um, really clear how my body felt and I was getting irritated at everything. Like at one point I was drinking like green tea and I wanted to smash the cup against the table. So I was, I freaked out and I was like, man, I need to go outside and have a breathe. And I was just like, what's happening? Like I couldn't understand, but it's just thinking now, like my body was just going through so much changes internally. And I just had these withdrawals, you know, from from all these um substances and i mean we, we we took like ecstasy and all this stuff so it would have been just clearing out from the inside and 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 then it started to um have an effect on me even further when i was working as a gym instructor so i got a job as a gym instructor at les mills and i was climbing up the stairs and i couldn't i couldn't step i was, I was so weak that I nearly fell on the ground and I was like, man, I'm doing something wrong. Like something is happening. Like, uh, and then I started researching and starting to understand that my liver was just heavily detoxing and I need, I just needed to wait a little bit, um, and make sure that I don't go, um, and change anything even more rapidly because yeah, um, I just needed to wait until these changes disappear. I mean, all these symptoms disappear. Um, and then eventually it's just, yeah, all, all of a sudden I felt the surge of energy coming up and, and, and that's like, for me, it was like, okay, we were on the right path now. So let's continue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the way, you know, you know, the, obviously the main the way mind works, you know, through like meditation, you can only focus on one thing at a time and there's something in your mind, a desire or something there the whole time that's sort of dominating your entire consciousness. So obviously when I was a drug addict, I was my, every, everything was drugs and that was the sort of thing that everything sort of uh, uh, pivoted around that point. Every single thing that was to do with my life was something to do with that. And obviously you have to, becoming yeah. that, when you remove the addiction, you have to replace that focus with something else. What did you replace your focus with? Well, I started training and just like going on the runs and biking a lot, like just started doing lots of um, lots of physical activities, and because I was working in the gym now, everything was just heavily involved in working. Um, I would work like fifty to sixty hours just to get my mind occupied, and 
and just growing and learning and and developing myself in the fitness industry because that's where I wanted to be from now on. Um, and I'm still here, you know. I'm, that's what I'm doing and and pursuing the same same um, same goal and 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 loving it so far because everything that I did back then was like preparing me for where I am today, you know. Uh, and and considering how much how much change that happened drastically in the 2013. And I was like, okay, like, so there's no more destructive habits. Like what can I occupy myself with? So I would read a lot of books, podcasts. I just started heavily investing into myself. Um, and, and that's all I did. Meditated in the park, sat in between my shifts. So I would do like a morning shift and a night shift. And in between my shift, I was just going to park and meditate, read books, like train. And my whole lifestyle was just around health and wellness, basically. And, and that's what helped me to go through all, all of the um, darkness, I guess, and during that time. Yeah. They are things that, I mean, I was speaking to a, an addiction specialist yesterday, and he said that it's like when, when you choose uh, not to be an addict anymore, it's not like you're going from a good time like he was having a really good time and now it's going to be difficult. It was like, no, actually you've been like hiding and the fact that you've had a really bad time and you're going to make it good. And people feel like they're giving yeah. up, giving up having a good time. But actually that's, you know, completely, you know, it's suffering with little peaks of joy, like right in the tiny little, tiny little peaks of joy and then boom, just into hell again, over and over again. There's, yeah. there's a few things that I've noticed that, that, that when people actually quit, there's a few things. Exercise is a key element. I mean, I had a fr my friend Tony, he quit heroin, which has got to be like one of the hardest things you can ever do. He said that he'd like get these crazy yeah. he cravings in like at three in the morning or even midnight. And he just like, just, just get out and just go running. He'd just run his way through it. Cause like, and just run that anxiety out of the body, like get, get it out. Yeah. All those things that are sort of like, cause it does it really, you feel it like really sitting in your body and that, that, that addiction just feels like like an anxiety inside of yourself and apparently the opposite of anxiety is the ability to be able to feel your emotions but when you've got that energy stuck inside your body that like physically right. actually going out and doing something and actually like you know getting that cortisol or whatever it is out of your system seems to be like an absolutely massive part and the you know the self-education that that was one of the like the biggest things for me if I didn't learn stuff then I wouldn't have ever made any changes. I wouldn't have known how to make any changes without doing that and the diet yeah. as well. And all those things, they, sort of, so they seem to come into the category of like, right, now I'm going to look after myself because I've really not been doing. Right, yeah. And 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 the um, James Clear, the, the guy that talks about the habits, um, he's got a book called Atomic Habits and it's actually quite a good book, good book talks about like compounding effects. So, when you when you switch uh, to a healthy lifestyle, so let's say you start exercising, most likely it's going to affect your diet because now you're going to start to think about your nutrition. So it goes both ways. So once you start to go into that compound effect, so if you let's say you start drinking, and then you start hanging out with bad people, and then you start to look into other stuff. So it's very compounding effect in terms of the habits. Um, one affects the other. So and that's what. It happens to most of the people that that stop drinking and i've seen it with many people before is that their lifestyle completely changes from eating to to their to their friends to where they go and, and what they look for and and, and it's um yeah it, it's it's mind-boggling how many people will change just because of one habit you know yeah 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 yeah, it's really interesting. I, I, I guess I really focused on um, when I moved to New Zealand. I just tried going like full, full straight edge, full as, as, as much as possible. I like quit everything. I, went, I just put myself into the most sober state that I could. Um, actually, that was almost the most anxious I've ever made myself because then my, my focus was actually like on business, which I hate that word. I just yeah. don't like the word business. Yeah. It doesn't agree with me. Yeah. I'd rather I'd rather give things away than than try and make than earn money out of people in a way I don't know I just like it feels better to give something away than it does to take some money off someone I really have always struggled with that um, so when so when yeah. I, I don't it wasn't necessarily because I was looking trying to only look after myself but even though I think in a sense at a deeper level it was the fact that my focus was business and it was still just the whole thing was completely all about me 
uh, I still think that I suffered from that. And it was only once that I sort of realized that actually the reason why I need to have all of these things in balance and in alignment is so that I can actually then go on to help other people because the opposite of addiction is connection. So you still need to yeah, go on and right. connect. So it's actually that through being able to connect and to be able to connect with people, we've got to be sober because if you're out your head, you, you know, you're not going to be able to get on the same wavelength as anybody sober and you're just going to remain in that shit place. So once you actually uh, sort all them things out and then go on to actually, you'd like, you, you need to have good health uh, and be fit and healthy to be of service to other people. So that, that I found that as my, as my consciousness, as, as the thing that I was going to put in the forefront, so I'm going to focus on that and then through Break the Chain and all these other things that we do, uh, these services that we offer, it's like you can't go and uh, offer people PT if you're on drugs or booze, can you? So it's like, all right, well, I need to serve these clients, exactly. so I need to I need to get all of these things in alignment. Yeah, yeah, correct. And yeah, you you can't you can't like it's the same. You know, there's a saying, "Can't don't trust a skinny baker," which is a bad analogy, but um, that's what they say. Like you know, because you live the lifestyle that you you lead, and yeah. and majority of the people will look up to you as a as a leader in terms of whatever that you're doing. And, um, and, and that's, that's the truth. It is just how it works. And, and people will always lead from the front and be in that particular region. If you're, whatever you're doing, if you're a chef or, um, a writer, you know, you practice what you preach. Yeah. And especially if you are in the, in the health industry, you have to lead by example and, and, and do the things yourself. Um, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to speak from experience and, and teach people the same, um, things that you, that you feel, you know, uh, and share that with people. Um, and, and man, like same as, same as being a personal trainer, like for example, I know for a fact that, um, a lot of the people are still work in the fitness industry and they, they are in the depression, major depression because of. I've, I've spoken to those people and they've reached out to me and, and, and some of the lifestyles that they lead is very destructive still, you know, and, and it's very real. Um, so we have to realize that, that not everyone is in the same place, even though they lead that lifestyle, um, like the same lifestyle as you. Well, I've seen a lot of these guys um, when he's yeah. right in town partying and stuff. You see a lot of these PTs in the tight gear, just going around town, and you know they're still drinking and doing the drugs, and which blows my mind that they can still look the way they do because I was either skinny or fat, and I was too much booze and I was fat, too much drugs and I was skinny, and I was looked terrible. But some of these guys are still going out and they're still partying, and it uh, blows my mind how they can do it. But you know, it's, there's no wonder that people end up depressed if they're, if they're doing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The, the word deep rest is like comes from deep rest from what do you need a deep rest from? Like from addictions, from bad situations, from bad people, from, you know, bad habits. And, and you just need to have a deep rest <laughs> because your body is automatically giving you the, the, um, the response. You need to isolate yourself and, and get yourself away, sleep. Um, all of the, the symptoms from depression just shows you that that it's like you don't want to live, you don't want to be around people. So it's like um, one of the doctors that I've listened to, he said that um, it's like why do people in, evolve to be depressed? Um, and and it doesn't make sense because by 2020, there's a, like it's going to be as equal to heart disease and cancer, you know. And and he said that it, it's it's an evolutionary protection system. It's like if your um, if your dog is sick, it always hides, right? And you can't really find the dog, and it sits in the corner because what it does is that because you're infected somehow inside, you want you don't want to infect other people, and so your your kind of system tells you to isolate yourself and 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 rest and just you know, and that's what like some people experience in terms of the resting. They don't want to eat, you know, your body's self-healing itself during that time and and the doctor explained that it's like because you're inflamed and your body is telling you to go and isolate yourself and look into resting 
clearing yourself from the bad substances. And it's, it's like a protective mechanism almost to tell you that you need to break away from the, the, um, the bad habits or whatever that you're, you're, you're having. Yeah. I mean, there's a, so many people, um, I mean, there's a, a lot of introvert. I mean, I've heard that technically there's no such thing as an introvert and an extrovert on like a, on a really deep level. These things are all just tastes that we have. Like some people like this food and some people have this thing and we could all potentially be both. Cause I know that I've been, I've been both. I was super extroverted always. And now I've completely flipped and I'm actually pretty introverted and I'm actually still trying to actually balance these two things. So I've got a bit of both. And it's funny because I, I know I completely experienced that where you get to the point where you, you just want to isolate yourself. You do crave that deep rest and then you do it, but then you actually suffer on a deeper level from the connection thing and you actually feel super disconnected and it sure. actually, you know, it's sure. sort of like a, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a balanced thing, isn't it? It's uh, which is unbelievably yeah. difficult to, uh, master for I think all of us I don't think there's anybody who completely uh, is a complete master of balance uh, without doing a lot of practice yeah uh, what's that movie where the guy disappears and runs into the um into the wild uh, into the wild oh, did you yeah. see that movie yeah, yeah yeah where he said true happiness is when when it's shared yeah and that's just yeah. It's just, he, he then realised that if he's by himself, he can't share the happiness. You know. I actually sell these little um, signs, and I've actually got a little sign that says that happiness is only real when oh, it's yeah. shared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed yeah. that. That was powerful. Cool movie. I'm right. Uh, that's yeah. on my to do list. I'm going to watch that movie again. Um, speak and uh, yeah, it's the nutrition that gets them in the end, which I wanted to talk to you about because um, you did my nutrition for me before. Now you say you've said to me before that the the, uh, the gut is like the second brain, and uh, I it's funny because people just have no consciousness and no awareness of their diet, and they they they're like completely ignorant. They they eat something. I, I'm I'm speaking about myself here. Like my, most of my life, I would eat something. And then I'd be sit there and I'd feel terrible. I'd have a headache. I'd feel anxious. And I'd be sat there like, why do I feel so bad? But it's like, I, just, I literally just put something in my mouth and I felt bad. But still, I wasn't making the connection between the fact that I've eaten something and now I feel like shit. You know, do you, I mean, you, so you know quite a lot about this. I was wondering if you could just uh, uh, evolve on, on that topic for me. Well, yeah, he- you're exactly right. So gut is your second brain because that's where your serotonin levels are and, and, and your, um, your gut bacteria is gonna, gonna relate to your, how you feel as well. So the stuff that you're feeding it and the stuff that, you know, you, you put into your body, it's going to grow that bacteria even more, more further. So, um, whether you're shoving cheeseburgers in your mouth or, um, or having a fresh squeezed juice, you know, not only you're you're growing that bacteria with but bad gut bacteria or good gut bacteria, and then it directly relates into the brain. So um, we know that serotonin level, you know, can can be increased um, by by certain foods and then decreased as well. So it's 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 just like an orchestra that's in your gut. Like you it, you know, one hormone affects the other hormone. So if you're gonna stuff up your like adrenals and serotonin levels and everything is going to be burnt out. It's going to affect, you know, it's again, it's going to have that effect on the other ones. So, um, and, and again, going back to that, um, inflammation. So you, you create inflammation in your body through, through food that you eat. So if your body is constantly inflamed on the, on the acute level, and then it forms into a chronic level. So, your body is just going to to be wanting to shut down. You know, it, it forms. It goes through stages. First, you go through irritation, then you go through inflammation, then you go through um, ulceration, then you go through induration, and then and then autoimmune disease, and then cancer. So you go through these stages through um, just just l- literally shoving stuff every day on a daily basis into your body without realizing how much effect it has in your gut. Um, and actually there was a, there, there was a, a interesting point made by, um, by someone that, you know, the appendix that, that normally lives, um, and, and people cut out actually in appendix is where the, the bacteria lives. Um, 
and, and that's you know there's millions and millions of of, of um, bacteria that that resides in in the, in the appendix. So you, your body is just feeding off that. So and, and it creates moods and emotions, and and then then you start to understand how um, like you are not a like a car where you just like mistakenly put diesel into a car and then all of a sudden it doesn't start. But then because we don't break down straight away, people are wanting to um indulge into um processed foods and stuff because you, your, your body craves it. it it it's like whatever you feed it it's going to crave and 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 the direct effect your your moods your emotions like i know for a fact if i eat like flour um refined flour products like pasta or um pastries it's 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 like my mind just goes very um, like, uh, like very blank, like almost to the point where, yeah, feels so bad. And, 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 and that's exactly what I experienced when I was a bartender is when I, I was drinking a lot, drinking coffee, eating processed foods. And at one point I had this, um, moment when I was like, man, I feel so dumb. Uh, I don't have any thoughts coming into my mind. I, I, I just feel dumb. And then uh, as all of a sudden, I was like, okay, I need more coffee because that's going to wake me up. That's going to create thoughts or whatever that I was thinking. And now it's like your mind, like this morning I made a freshly squeezed juice. I had um, celery, cucumber, um, beetroot, um, turmeric, lime, and the energy just stays very clean. It's like you don't have the crashes. You um you are more aware of things and it's 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 just amazing how much it affects you on on a deeper level and conscious level as well. Your diet yeah. is unbelievably good. I've, I've spent some time around you and I've seen how you eat. You really do. You're, <laughs> you, you're not a skinny baker. You you really do. You do do it. And I mean, I think you have a. I think because of your discipline and the way the way that you are, just like you you find it really not too challenging to go through these really austere things and like in terms of discipline you you can do it i mean there's so many people out there i'm one of these people like especially with diet that i find it so it's, it's one of the f- things that i find hardest is uh, food for me and i mean at the moment i'm doing re- reasonably well because obviously being a lot happier now i find it not so bad not to, to 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 reach for these things when i'm unhappy because that's just from that's just comfort for me um I mean, around diet, what would you say is like the easiest way to sort of like get control of these cravings? Got any tips and tricks? Yeah, I would say just start cutting out the processed stuff. Um, Like slowly, you know, start cutting out the sugars and stuff because you you have to realize that even even though you're having that, um, sugar in terms of, you know, where you put it into a coffee, um, whether you put it into, um, like in terms of the sauce, you know, like Sri Raja sauce has like 24 grams of sugar, 200 grams. So you will have the same effect as, you know, the studies that came out, like it lights up the same part of the brain as when you take, um, uh, drugs. Um, so sugar is one of the things that you want to cut out is because it's just like triggering that, that, um, that effect you know on on the addiction level so again it's just like processed foods even if you eat non non non-plum based you know having cut out sugar processed refined products like flour um and yeast as well yeast is one of the things that you don't um i I can't remember the the exact um word in english because i know it in russian but the yeast cannot be killed like it, it still breeds in your body so having bread that has yeast in it, which is like s- synthetically and artificially made, causes a lot more problems in your body just by eating refined um, refined products like pastries with yeast and breads with yeast. So th- those are the massive things that you want to cut out is like sugar, um, refined um, flour products and stuff like that because they just create so much problems in your body. Um, and there's no nutrients in them as well. So you kind of – just fill in empty, uh, empty um, nutrient sort of food into your body, and then you f- you still crave stuff because you your body is telling you that it's missing some nutrients or uh, vitamins or enzymes that your body needs, and then you still feel hungry, and that's why people 
gorge on more food and more food because your body just constantly feels hungry and hungry, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I find that a very difficult um, cycle to, yeah. to break. I mean, I think, I think learning about, I mean, as a kid, I grew up like, obviously you're drinking fizzy drinks and stuff. No one, everybody's drinking fizzy drinks. No one tells you that there's anything wrong with that. But it's only if you actually, you know, got the amount of sugar that was in one of them things and you put, I mean, I know what 40 grams of sugar looks like because I used to sell drugs. I know what that looks like. And that's a lot. If you had 40 grams of drugs, you'd be happy with that. And you'd see that. And that's like, <laughs> yeah. that's not a small amount of sugar. You saw that, you'd be like, yeah, there's no way you would drink that. There's not, there's just no way. Yeah. You wouldn't eat that. You wouldn't even eat one gram of that on a spoon. You'd be like, oh, that's loads of sugar. But it's like about being un- completely unconscious of what you're putting in your body, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. And and food can be treated as an addiction as well. You can abuse yourself eating 10 cheeseburgers just like, you know, smoking or taking heroin every day. You know, you can abuse yourself using using food as well. So it's it's the same thing. It's just different different tools, different tools that you can abuse yourself by. I found one thing really yeah. interesting is from, from a yogic point of view, obviously like part of the, if you're going to do the renounced yogic process is where you, you, you learn to control the senses. You know this, I'm sure. But you, you slowly, one by one, you control all the senses until you're not uh, getting any satisfaction. You get no, take no satisfaction externally. You send yourself inwards and then you can potentially raise your life air out of your body and have these out-of-body experiences and stuff. And they say that the, the, the first thing that you need to do in order to control your senses is actually to control the mouth because that's where things start from. And if you can control what you do with the mouth, so that would be what you're saying uh, and what you're eating and things like that, everything to do with the, with the tongue, then you can from that mm. you can actually control the other senses so easily. I mean, it's so yeah. hard, so hard not to say something, isn't it? Sometimes just to talk it, shit. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. wouldn't put eating and yeah. talking in the same category, but from a yogic point of view, that's actually the same sense. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, it's 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 almost like people don't like e- even how you say like from the tongue point of view when people like I, I still find it very strange when pe- people call someone like a girl they call themselves they call them bitches or uh or if they call someone a good cunt like it's it's funny but it's like it still have this negative notion when you when you say it um and it's exactly the same as when you when you listen to something like a music with bad lyrics it's like it feeds that um like bad energy in in into the um whatever that you're doing you know and and the same with food and yeah like you said it's 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 a very um deep um spiritual practice that we're talking about here and obviously it's harder for people to comprehend but it's it's it has an effect on people for sure yeah yeah yeah, it's definitely been one. I'll tell you one of the, the, the best things that I've actually quit. I think it's the only thing I've ever quit cold turkey and just been like, boom, I've like, and actually done it the way that, you know, you quit something properly, and that was coffee. I completely yeah. just, because I was drinking one cup a day, and that, that wasn't so bad. But I, had, I, was like, I think I was like hypersensitive to coffee. Like this, this thing just clearly did not agree with me. And... The, I was getting I had really negative side effects from it, like uh, re, like like really roller coaster energy. I, I'd describe it as same as drugs and all these other uh, things that you do, like this this energy where it's just doing this and it's it's tiring, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I went went from one cup a day, and then I was sort of like two cups a day. And you know, being an addict, it just creeps up, doesn't it? And like by the point, bear in yeah. mind, I was hypersensitive to it, and I was having like one cup in the morning, one cup at lunchtime one cup for like afternoon break at work and then go to the gym and be like, well, you've got to have another cup of coffee before you go to the gym else you're not going to be strong enough. That's what I believe. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah. you just have to, you just have to do it. It's compulsive. And I did it. And then one day I was actually at Les Mills and I actually like got my, my chest like went like really tight and my legs went weak and I like, I collapsed. <laughs> I like fully collapsed. And it was wow. like the first time I was like, this actually feels like, you know, not far off a heart attack. <laughs> I've got to stop doing this. Wow. And then once I actually yeah. quit coffee and got off it, I just had this clarity that I'd, you know, I'd never, I, I don't feel like I'd ever had that, that level of clarity because my diet was pretty good then. That was when you was doing the nutrition, I think. And I was just sort of like, wow, I actually feel 
calm. And, and to be fair, when I first started doing it, my level, my energy went from that. And I'm doing, if anyone knows a podcast, I'm doing roller coaster with my hands. Um, and then it went to sort of like a real low, super low, shallow. And I was just like tired all day, yeah. but stable. And I was re- uh, relieved to be stable. And going to work was difficult. But every single day, it just picked up a bit. And I was drinking ashwagandha as well, like Indian ginseng, because apparently yeah. that replenishes your adrenal glands. And it tastes like crap. It says, the, it says the smell of horse on the back of the packet. It's not great. But yeah, and then slowly, oh, day by day. And then I was just like, it just picked up and I just felt back to normal again. And I was just like, you know, I felt like I'd really been released of something that had been uh, imprisoning me. It was nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually um, have to wrap it up because I, I need to go on a call, another call. But um, is there anything else that you kind of wanted me to no, ask? Man, that, that's perfect. We... We're coming up to yeah. we're coming up to yeah. an hour, and not far off. Um, yeah, thank you very yeah. much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for your wisdom yeah. across uh, multiple areas. And uh, is, how can people find you? Um, so they can find me on. I mostly interact on Instagram, Power Surge Wellness. Um, uh, or Facebook, yeah, Power Surge Wellness. Um, otherwise, Liz Mills, Victoria Street in Auckland, if, if anyone wants to have a talk and, and chat, yeah. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. If you enjoyed this, uh, like and sub- uh, subscribe to Break the Chain. Follow us on YouTube. Just starting a podcast as well. Don't know how you find that yet, but I'll figure that out and I'll stick it somewhere in, the, in some text. <laughs> All right, bro, thank you so much. Yeah.